Ça fait plusieurs fois que j'essaye de vous joindre pour euh, avoir un, un entretien avec Isabelle Ocrin. Ça fait quand même trois mois que j'essaie d'avoir un entretien. Et en plus, je vous envoie plein de mails et, et, et j'ai pas de réponse pour mail non plus. Oui, mais elle est très occupée, donc elle n'est pas forcément disponible. Hein. Petit chemin qui pas France, bonjour. Oui, bonjour. Puis-je parler euh, Olivier Blanc, s'il vous plaît Il n'est pas du tout disponible. Et je ne souhaite absolument pas euh, parler de cette industrie euh, au niveau de la presse. Il est actuellement impossible de laisser un message. Merci de raccrocher et de rappeler ultérieurement. Il est actuellement impossible, impossible... Five million smokers worldwide die each year. That's 30 747s crashing every day. A hundred million smokers died in the 20th century. If nothing changes, a billion will die in the 21st. It is an epidemic that has been built on uh, unparalleled Uh, corporate uh, deceit, negligence, I believe it's criminal negligence. I remember the last time I saw my father. We strolled, surrounded by the fall colors of Montreal, He was 56 years old and weighed 48 kilos. I used to smoke too, despite my asthma and repeated bouts of pneumonia. It took me 20 years to quit. Now that I'm a mother, I don't want my children falling into the same trap. Why is cigarette smoking so popular and acceptable despite all the information we have? That's a question I've spent the last three years of my life investigating. I've dug through internal industry documents, met manufacturers and marketing experts, interviewed public health specialists from around the world, trying to understand. Since 1953, the industry has known that 94% of lung cancers occur in smokers. Did you say I'll feel better smoking, Philip Morris? Yes, you'll feel better. And here are the reasons why. In case after case, coughs due to smoking disappear. Parched throat clears up. That stale, smoked out feeling vanishes. The tobacco manufacturers uh, have lied about the risks of their products. They have lied about targeting children. And the documents show clearly that they have been engaged in these practices for decades, uh, and it shows clearly that uh, executives at the highest level knew exactly uh, what was going on. There have been infamous uh, meetings throughout uh, history. One took place in the Plaza Hotel in New York City in 1953, when senior executives from American tobacco companies got together with John Hill of the public relations firm, Hill and Knowlton. That meeting led directly to hundreds of millions of deaths. And the negative, the tragic impact of that meeting is still being felt today. Cigarette brands had been at war with one another. Now they had to find common ground at all cost. Thus began the longest and most expensive public relations campaign in history. From studying the documents related to the actual meeting, this is how I imagined it. Gentlemen, as you all know, we have a very serious problem on our hands. The medical profession seems hell-bent on slandering our products. People are giving up smoking at an alarming rate. And uh, over the last few months, we've lost a substantial amount of business. And I mean all of us. Tell us about it. 
Our salesmen are frantic. Obviously, we need to close ranks and initiate some common action. Drastic action. Well, that's why I've invited John here from Hill and Knowlton to give us his wise counsel. So, Hill, what do you publicity experts know about war? It seems to me that if we are to do battle, our armies, so to speak, have to be ready for a dramatic change. I suggest a common realignment of company policy on a united front. Now, it's vital that we influence opinion shapers as well as the public at large. The cost of such an operation will be high, very high. Well, as long as we can keep on selling. Our first step should be a nationwide ad campaign, prints, TV, radio, stating that cigarettes do not cause cancer and that for the tobacco industry, public health is paramount. And of course, if cigarettes were proven to be dangerous, you would pull them off the market. Millions of copies of these falsehoods, boldly entitled A Frank Statement, blanketed America. We accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other consideration in our business. And that's where we stand today. C'est la franche déclaration de l'industrie du tabac. The frank statement was a tissue of lies from beginning to end, designed to cast doubt on a certainty. Had any other group of manufacturers behaved in this way, their product would have been banned outright. The tobacco industry not only escaped having to deal with the questions of concerned smokers, but there was hardly any reaction from government officials. Tobacco manufacturers went about their business relatively unopposed until the big American trials of the 1990s, when 46 states took joint action against the industry, suing for damages to public health. Executives of the seven largest cigarette companies were called to testify. Let me ask you first, and I'd like to just go down the row, uh, whether each of you believes uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. In 1998, the Master Settlement Agreement was signed. The industry agreed to pay $206 billion to avoid a verdict. It also promised to cease marketing to young people, but only in the US. Most importantly, the American industry was obliged to make their internal documents available to the public. No documents, old or new, are to be destroyed until 2008. The industry responded by supplying millions of pages which were largely of no interest, such as taxi receipts and letters of credit. But dogged determination can uncover the essence of the cigarette business. Nicotine is addictive. We are in the business of selling an addictive drug. Is there any difference between Philip Morris, now called Altria, Altadis, which used to be known as Seta, and British American Tobacco? Is there collusion between the companies? Yes. Is there a significant difference between the activities of the cigarette companies around the world? No. Over and over again, on those issues that I've been involved in, we see very similar activity by all of the companies. One of the main reasons why Marlboro became such a successful cigarette around the world was the use of ammonia. You know, you introduce ammonia into your cigarette and you increase the nicotine uptake into the body, the bioassimilation 
of, uh, of nicotine. So everybody else was dissecting Marlboros. They figured out that it was ammonia. They didn't tell the public. Did they tell, did they tell the rest of the world? No. What did, what did they do? Did they say that Philip Morris shouldn't be introducing ammonia into their cigarettes? No. They sought ways to introduce it themselves. So yes, there's a similar pattern of behavior. Well, let's uh, keep things in focus. Who's our enemy? It's not the public. It's not the politicians. It's the medical profession. Scientists. Yeah, whatever they come up with, whatever they tell the public, we have to create new scientific data to refute it, or at least discount it. So we need more research. No, we yeah. We've got all the scientific data we need. Look, either we're in this together or we're not. We are fighting for our survival. Look, I think we're in this together or we're not. We are fighting for our survival here. Now, we can do our own in-house research till we're blue in the face. But, look, don't you understand? Whatever research we do won't necessarily convince all of those smokers out there. That's right, sir. We're talking about investing in tobacco-friendly health experts, our own independent scientists who can write articles, such as the truth about cigarettes. Cigarette smoking is the most significant public health problem facing our people. More Americans die every year from smoking-related diseases than from AIDS, car accidents, murders, suicides, and fires combined. In the view of the U.S. Department of Justice, the 1953 meeting marked the beginning of the conspiracy. In 2004, they undertook another major trial based, this time, on U.S. anti-mafia law, the RICO Act. Robert Blakey teaches international law in London. He was on the team that drafted the RICO Act. The RICO Act had, not as its exclusive focus or target, the Mafia. It had any group, corporation, or union that operated by a pattern of illegal behavior. And so what you have to find is a central organizing group. And this is now organized exactly like the Mafia. Here is each of the families, the major companies. And what do they do? For the purpose of this scheme to defraud, takes money and personnel from each of the major families. And then they run it through a committee of lawyers, not a committee of scientists, a committee of lawyers, to conduct or participate in a pattern of illegal activity. And the illegal activity was a scheme to defraud. Who would they defraud? The medical establishment, the drug agency, the Congress, the president. And finally, they would defraud consumers. This industry did it, did it intentionally, and did it to make money. There's no functional difference between an organized crime family that sells cocaine or heroin and kills people. They're racketeers. And a cigarette industry that sells a product which used as directed kills. Ladies and gentlemen, we have changed. We now admit that our products are addictive and deadly. This is why we've decided to recall all of our tobacco products from the market until we can find a safe replacement. Thank you. Are the cigarette companies operating the same way today? Distinguished chemist Bill Ferrone worked in a key position at Philip Morris for eight years. He agreed to share his experience. I joined Philip Morris in 1976. The purpose of my joining Philip Morris was to reduce the risk in cigarettes, that is to make safer cigarettes. Not safe, but safer. We succeeded in finding many different ways to make them safer. As a matter of fact, uh, many of the products that are now being talked about, the technology for those products goes back to even before I joined Philip Morris. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars was spent on doing research that would reduce the harm of the cigarette, but it wasn't actually used. In terms of the conduct of the industry, if you're selling a product that has a very high risk and you know how to make a product which dramatically reduces that risk, 
until they actually do it, they haven't changed. If it's nicotine people want, we can give it to them safely. They can make inhalers. You can put the nicotine in there and suck it in and, you know, get without any other chemicals. They've set up a separate company that's in the pharmaceutical business called Chrysalis, selling this instrument that's going to deliver drugs, but not nicotine. They could use it for nicotine. It would be possible for it to deliver nicotine? Why sure. don't they do it then? Well, because they don't want to. <laughs> In fact, in 1983, Philip Morris applied enough pressure to pharmaceutical companies to restrict access to Nicorette products for 10 years. Another former executive, Jeremy, has bravely broken the industry's code of silence. He recently left Altidis and has requested anonymity. We're here to do business, not to question the product we're selling. We consider the onus is on the consumer and on the state. There's virtually no difference between products, so the only way to differentiate them is through brand image. The primary communication medium for the brand is the package. So manufacturers are constantly working on packs, which are the brand's showcase. This is their canvas for the image, the mystique, which regulations don't allow them to develop elsewhere. It's very sophisticated marketing. Quantitative research, qualitative research, focus groups, group and individual interviews, pre-testing, post-testing. We try to deconstruct the consumer. I started around 14, and at first it was to fit in with the older kids, to look good. One day you buy a pack and you end up smoking alone, and then it's too late. Once you're mature enough to say smoking's dumb, it's too late. Canada was the first to launch these graphic messages covering half the cigarette pack. Since 2001, Australia, Brazil, and some European countries have followed suit. Every cigarette is doing you damage, and each time you buy a new pack, you support an industry without ethics. We don't smoke this year, we just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. Major price increases helped lower youth smoking rates from 50 to 37 percent in France. And in Canada, only 19 percent of young people smoke. Successful measures also include banning advertising and limiting youth access to cigarettes by prohibiting sales to minors. Hello? Hey, what's up? A party? Is it definite C? Oh, it's tonight. Oh, gee, hold on, let me check. Um, yeah, I think I can make it. Okay, bye. So what do the cigarette companies do about that? Throw cigarette parties, of course, for consenting adults only. Go get him. Heidi's job is to gather evidence of these marketing practices in order to pressure the Quebec government. And it's working. Thanks to activists like Heidi, tobacco control measures in Quebec have now banned this type of promotion. Manufacturers are entirely focused on grabbing and holding on to the youngest consumer possible. Because after the age of 25, people rarely change brands. Is the purpose of advertising to attract new smokers? No, it is not. The purpose of cigarette advertising is to get people 
either to switch to your brand who already smoke or to make sure that your current smokers are happy with the brand that they smoke. Looking at the horizontal axis of Mr. Johnston's chart, it says under the age column that the beginning age of the smokers that he apparently studied in looking at the POL national roster data was the age of 15. Well, do you agree? Is that with a question? That? Yes. Do you agree that that? I absolutely, says? I absolutely disagree that that's what happened. Um, uh, I, I would be. I would be more than shocked. I had my first cigarette when I was 13. When I found out how bad it was, I tried to quit. But I couldn't. They say nicotine isn't addictive. How can they say that? My salary is $650,000 a year. Are there any non-cash aspects of your compensation package? There's, huh? there's stock, um, and what we'll call the net profit, right? If, That's fine. At today's price, it's around $12 million. So you can see what 1,200 people actually look like. Truth is a trademark, a counter-marketing concept. Their slogan, spread truth. Their goal, to expose the lies of the industry and ask real questions. Why do we cave in to the massive presence of cigarettes in society? Why do we close our eyes to the tobacco epidemic? Truth is like a razor against the deafness, the blindness, and the silence surrounding the inner workings of the business. The True Campaign is a campaign designed to tell people in the 12 to 25 demographic about the harmful effects of tobacco products. And basically, we're using a guerrilla marketing approach when we tell people and we also interact with people so they can learn about facts that come over to the booth. One person dies due to tobacco every eight seconds. 12,000 children are left without a mother every year. And 31,000 children are left without a father every year. In America, every single year. My favorite memory is he used to um, always put me up on his shoulders. I would say, Dad, he watched this cool movie with me. Dad, can I go outside with you and help you work? I miss him with all my heart. Zach has lost his father. He is the real victim of the industry, but it may not prevent him from becoming a smoker too, especially if he likes movies. The most effective marketing tools to initiate children to the world of smoking are film and television. Cigarettes are so present in movies, we don't even see them. It's the wallpaper effect. We've gone back now and actually studied a random sample of movies going all the way back to 1950. And what you find is that over from 1950, 60, 70, 80, smoking sort of slowly dropped, and in about 1990, it shot up. And we now have more smoking in movies today than we did 50 years ago. Sylvester Stallone signed a contract with Brown and Williamson, promising to use their cigarettes in no fewer than five feature films for the modest sum of $500,000. Philip Morris paid to put Marlboros in Superman II. There were no smoking in Superman I. We have the contract. I mean, the theme of the Smoke Free Movies campaign is they're either corrupt or stupid. If they're continuing to get payoffs and selling out their customers to big tobacco, they're corrupt. And if they're giving away hundreds of millions of dollars worth of free advertising to the tobacco industry for free, they're stupid. Stan Glantz recommends that we rate films where cigarettes are promoted as adult films. 
Known as the best paid screenwriter in Hollywood for his impressive filmography, Joe Esther has always glamorized smoking. What a Hollywood film, what big smoking does, is it aims a revolver at a 13 year old child. And when that child is in his 50s, that gun goes off. I started smoking when I was 12 years old. This particular form of cancer is also the kind that can come back. Um, and, you know, they, and, and they've been very honest with me, and they say, look, um, this can come back in a month, and you could be dead in six months if you have a lump on your neck. So I live that way, and I tell anyone this, you do not want to go through losing 80% of your throat, not being able to speak, trying to breathe with a trach, um, and you will come to exactly that point somehow, in some way, if you keep smoking. I'm convinced that there are probably thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who, who are attracted to smoking because I glamorize it in so many movies, especially in Basic Instinct. I liked having sex with him. He wasn't afraid of experimenting. One of the major tobacco companies came out with a cigarette brand called Basic, and the advertising, not coincidentally, in the first magazine ads was the word Basic on a movie marquee. I, uh, I was actually asked if I wanted to be involved in that smoking campaign. Um, and uh, thankfully, I didn't want to go that far. How do you market a product when all forms of advertising are prohibited? I found someone in the marketing department of British American Tobacco in France who agreed to talk about the internal workings of the company. To guarantee complete anonymity, our interview has been transcribed and spoken by an actor. So how were you hired? I have a friend who works at BAT, and she brought me in. When a senior position opens up, the job is posted on internal email. There's a 5,000 franc signing bonus, and after three months, if the person is confirmed in the position, there's another 5,000 franc bonus. Had I not been brought in, I would never have gotten the job. It's a delicate game of constantly going right to the limit of what the law permits. In the industry, rival tobacco makers will share information and consult with each other to jointly determine just how far they can go. When we're considering taking borderline actions, we'll meet to discuss it together. At the meeting, a lawyer will explain the law and the potential risks. We are fully informed of all the ramifications before a decision is made. Here is a promotional clip for Gauloise from the year 2000. Totally illegal in France, it ran in discotheques in Europe, wherever they could get away with it. For more than a decade, lawyer Francis Caballero has been bringing the industry to court in France. I will plead that the pack of cigarettes is the shame of modern capitalism. I will talk about the various enticements the industry uses to get people smoking by 14 when they don't realize the danger, so that they're hooked by 18. Their cynical claim is that smokers die younger, so the extra cost of the state health plan is balanced out by reduced pension payments because smokers don't live as long. Cigarette taxes, often over 70% of the retail price, are an important source of revenue for governments. It can be difficult to reconcile public health concerns with this tax windfall. Moreover, a document from 1963 shows that the Minister of Health told the Finance Minister, we can no longer hide the truth about the dangers of tobacco. In 2003, the right to silence overrode the duty to inform again, when Francis Caballero defended a victim of tobacco. In the 60s, SEDA had no duty to inform because that would have lowered the revenue to the public treasury. In fact, a French court of appeal in Orléans ruled that the health of a 14-year-old French citizen was less important than the health of the treasury. 
and that tobacco was a fiscal product. If the public is informed, revenue will drop. If there's a threat to revenue, then the obligation to inform disappears. I'd never heard anything like it. That was set as defense, and they won. It was laughable. I said, wait a minute, tobacco isn't a fiscal product, it's a consumer product. I don't have cancer of the wallet, I have cancer of the lung. Between the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health, there is an obvious conflict of interest. And it's not just a question of money. The industry uses precise mathematical strategies of influence to achieve its goals. Here's a crash course in perfect lobbying, courtesy of Philip Morris. Order tightly targeted surveys, contact politicians through strategic contributions to their political parties, then communicate with the voters through phony smokers associations and woo the media by cozying up to key journalists. All will now pressure legislators to make the right decisions. We've had to drag governments kicking and screaming across the finish line. Uh, they've never arrived there willingly, happily showing leadership on their own. We've had uh, public inquiries into virtually every industry, including the potato industry, but we've never had a public inquiry or a royal commission into an industry that kills 47,000 Canadians a year. We've known since the 50s that tobacco is a danger to health, but for many years tobacco has been a nuisance for non-smokers. Beyond the nuisance factor, we know that tobacco smoke causes heart attacks and lung cancer in non-smokers. Today we know it's a factor in sudden infant death, and a recent study proves that it has a considerable impact on breast cancer. Doctor, we'd like to get your professional opinion on smoking. Smoking is the most preventable cause of death in society today. Okay. Thanks for coming uh, in. 87% of lung cancers are caused by smoking. Very, um... Larynx, pharynx, kidneys, bladder. Uh, thank you. Lots of people die from bee stings, but you don't see warning labels on bees, do you? Doctor, how quickly can you be in Washington? Scientific subversion was concocted by the industry in the U.S. and then exported to Europe. Geneva was the scene of an unprecedented scientific fraud. Pascal Ditelme and Jean-Charles Riel discovered the scheme. À Genève. In Geneva, two major conferences organized by Professor Rylander were often cited by the tobacco industry as proving or demonstrating that the scientific community did not believe that passive smoking was dangerous. I was intrigued, so I typed in the name Rylander on the Philip Morris site. And what pops up? 16,000 documents. Wow. Uh, that's quite a scientific career in the service of Philip Morris that no one knew about. It all began a few hundred kilometers away in Cologne, Germany. In Bifo, a formerly secret laboratory run by Philip Morris performed animal experiments, in particular, secondhand smoke inhalation. There's a notorious memo that says, we're buying in Bifo because in Bifo is where we might do some of the things which we are reluctant to do in this country. Let's go back to my time at Philip Morris. Um, I was a director at that point of research, and we were not to have any direct contact with in Bifo because they didn't want any of the documents 
to be traced directly back to Philip Morris. Why not? <clears throat> because they, if we got a lawsuit, they would be in court, those documents. Dr. Rylander was someone we hired to act as an overseer of the research being done at MBIFO on behalf of Philip Morris USA. What I know of his research is that all of it was tilted toward minimizing the risk. That is, it was done in such a way to show other factors that could be responsible for the effects other than the cigarette smoke. The hunt was on for the reddest of red herrings. The name of the game, find the culprit. Does your risk for lung cancer increase if you live with a canary? In China, could the non-smoking wives of smokers be victims of their taste for green tea? And in Geneva, Rylander wonders if eating green beans could be more harmful than living with a mother who smokes. Rylander received 300 reports from MBIFO, in which MBIFO clearly states that secondhand smoke is four or five, or in some cases, 20 times more toxic than the smoke inhaled by the active smoker. Nevertheless, officially in his lectures, Rylander says passive smoking is not dangerous. A mother can safely smoke around her children. It's a major breach of professional research ethics. The issue is his double talk. He presents himself as a university researcher with all the intellectual independence that entails, while he is secretly employed by the tobacco industry and operating according to strategic objectives of the industry. The man on the Philip Morris payroll gives lectures around the world on environmental medicine. Ragnar Rylander agrees to see me in his hometown of Gothenburg, Sweden. You did realize at one point in your correspondence with Philip Morris lawyers that they were trying to get you to uh, say things that were more in their favor. I mean, oh yes, they tried. They try. Uh, they tr didn't try to to alter the data. I mean, this was not be the possible for lawyers or 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 any others. But they tried to make the interpretations of the data in their way, and. Um, as you understand, interpretation of scientific data is always something which is not a very sort of sharp or a half, uh, hard point thing. It, it, it is open to different interpretations. So I must confess, I found even some of the remarks were quite valuable because I had gone maybe... <coughs> <coughs> so I had gone maybe a bit too far in my interpretation on the toxicity side. So I was happy to accept, but this was except exceptions. And the real large uh, air efforts they did in terms of, was an article in the science they suggest I write, there was conclusions they um, suggest I altered. I mean, I plainly refused to do this. It's, uh, it would have been unethical from a scientific point of view. We wrote some of the things that he signed. I mean, uh, uh, people that I knew wrote documents that were approved by our attorneys that were given to Dr. Rylander for his signature and then they were sent out. I did my projects and I was being funded for these projects and, and nothing else. We, we understood that something was going on and of course you couldn't realize that this was not happening but the feeling of collective guilt is something which is very very difficult to pinpoint afterwards. I mean it's just like Germany, why didn't people feel collective guilt for what Hitler did? No, most of the people went on doing their business um, till it was too late. So I guess that's a parallel as good as any. Hello, Gabby, how are you today? Heather Crow, a waitress in Ottawa, Canada for 30 years, never smoked in her life, yet she has lung cancer. Very well, I'm still in remission. That would. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was an industry-related disease, is what I considered. Uh, it should be compensation. It's as if I lost my hand at work, they would have paid me. So this, because I'm losing my lungs and my life, I should be entitled to work compensation. At that point, I was told, well, there's never been a case, good luck. And I said, well, you're looking at the first case. 
We are dying to serve you. I've lost my career. I've lost my job. I've lost, I'm losing my life now. I mean, I have 5% chance of living three years. And my whole goal is to be the last person to die from secondhand smoke at work. It's too late for me, but uh, if I can get the message out so others understand why we need the bands and why they have to be there. Le sujet du tabac. Tobacco and its health implications concern every country in the world. Accordingly, the World Health Organization was asked to give a worldwide response to this pandemic. The Resolution and WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control are adopted. And the fast 192 countries that make up the World Health Organization have agreed and signed a treaty, a framework convention on tobacco control. It contains all the essential measures, advertising bans, non-smokers' rights, prohibition of deceptive designations such as light and mild, a ban on cigarette sales to young people, price increases, the fight against smuggling. These measures are much more effective when applied together in a concerted tobacco-free initiative. The effectiveness of the Framework Convention will be determined by the political will of each government to apply concrete measures in their respective countries. For the contraband issue, for example, we are still far from a global solution. Following Canada's lead, governments in Europe have already undertaken joint actions so as not to lose their enormous tax revenue to cigarette smuggling. The governments of Belgium and France are among the ten countries that support the European Commission in a suit filed against R.J. Reynolds. The charges? Organized smuggling, money laundering, corruption. Of the thousand billion cigarettes exported every year, 700 billion are legally imported. 300 billion have simply disappeared. Try to imagine Toyota saying, somewhere between Japan and Europe, 30% of the cars we loaded onto the ship just vanished. We can't understand it. We don't know where they went. Smuggling is not a natural phenomenon. It's organized by the industry. It's smuggling using high-speed craft purchased from the former East German Navy, so there are almost no ships that can catch them. You have to use aerial surveillance and wait until they run out of fuel to be able to board them. In July 2004, Philip Morris paid a billion dollars to the European Commission and promised to cease all smuggling activity in Europe. The future of the cigarette companies is clearly elsewhere in countries where regulations are rudimentary or non-existent. And to penetrate those markets, the industry creates powerful imagery adapted to each culture and uses any and all means to distribute its products. Internationally, one very effective strategy is first to flood the market with brand products before they arrive officially. How? you simply smuggle the stuff in. Whether the operation is organized by the industry or by the distributors, the results are the same. Major international brands appear in a number of markets selling for much less than they should be. Once a market is flooded by this vast quantity of smuggled goods, it's much easier for the industry to go to the government of these countries and say, listen, you're losing 20 or 30 percent of tax revenue because this contraband is being smuggled in. So help us to set up in your country to distribute or even manufacture this product because it's an easy way for you to recover this lost tax revenue. Monsieur Tava, 
The tobacco industry expects a 16% increase in tobacco use in Africa to make up for the 8% drop in consumption in Western Europe, which means that today, people in Africa are a favored target of the tobacco industry. Tobacco products are everywhere. They're easier to get than food. You might have to walk a kilometer to buy a bag of sugar, but only two meters to buy cigarettes. Niger, like all African countries, has enough scourges to deal with. AIDS, malaria, meningitis, famine. Do we need more scourges that could be avoided? In the African markets, the industry has really pulled out all the stops in developing communication, marketing and promotional policies. There are free samples. They give cigarettes away by the handful to get people to smoke. There's sponsorship of various kinds, like sports sponsorship, music sponsorship. To hook young people, the tobacco industry launches symbolic brands of cigarettes with a strong message aimed at youth. For example, the latest brand Philip Morris introduced in Niger is called Visa. They launched a brand called Visa after market research showed them that these days, young people are only interested in one thing. Not going to school, not going to university, but getting a visa for the United States, France, Canada, and so on. She says there's no food in the house, but he'd rather spend his last coins on cigarettes than on food for the children. How can I stop him now that he's addicted? Some kids who don't have enough money to smoke will beg their parents, give me 25 francs, give me 50 francs. And when you can't get the money from your parents, what do you do? You start to steal. She says, if there is a power that could put a stop to the sale of cigarettes once and for all, we would be the happiest women in the world. There is no industry behind AIDS pushing people to contract AIDS. There's no ad campaign promoting AIDS, so awareness campaigns are useful with AIDS. But with tobacco, dramatic action is called for. We must demonize the tobacco industry, which is not a responsible organization. It's a criminal consortium. I certainly requested me. You're a lawyer. He always wants to see lawyers. He liked them young, 13, 14. Sold them poison loaded with an addictive drug. He seduced them, lured them in. The poison ate away their bodies, but the drug kept their brains hooked on it. And when they got too old or died, he just went after more kids. How'd he get away with it for so long? He ran a tobacco company. Will the industry react when it really is on the ropes, like what they are, racketeers? I don't know. And I don't know because they're not on the ropes. They're winning.